welcome everyone. Just a quick introduction why we decided to discuss this topic. Uh, usually doctors learn how to deal with complaints by experience. And according to the GMC, the IMG's doctors and the doctors from ethnic minorities are more at risk of getting complaints from patients and, the family, and their families. So we thought it's an important topic to address as part of our support to the doctors who recently started working in the UK. And we think it, it will be helpful for those who's been, who have been working for a while in the UK. So we invited Mr. Matt Dunkley to tell us if we can avoid it and how to deal with the complaints the best way. I would like to thank him a lot for his effort and time, and I will let him introduce himself and start the presentation. Thank you very much, Amira, um, and uh, great to be talking to you. Uh, I'm Matt Dunkley, one of the consultants at Darrant Valley Hospital in Dartford in Kent. And uh, I would like to talk about how you can handle complaints and hopefully how you can avoid complaints. What we're going to cover over the next few minutes is uh, why do patients or their relatives complain when we're trying to do our best? What are the most common complaints and do they come in themes? Are there any cultural or communication issues that need to be addressed? I'll talk a little bit about the basics of the NHS complaints procedures, uh, nothing too technical there, and what to do and not to do after receiving a complaint with a few examples of real life complaints, which have been just modified slightly. And uh, in summary, just how to avoid complaints as much as we possibly can. Well, it's interesting that people have got a lot more used to complaining than they used to. So the statistics show that back in the 1970s, only about 9,000 complaints were received by hospitals every year. But by 2012, 2013, NHS hospitals had rocketed in the number of complaints to 162,000. And nearly 10 years later, uh, that is significantly more than that. Although recently in the coronavirus pandemic, fortunately, complaints have tailed off considerably. So why is that? Has the NHS got worse or have people got better at complaining? Or is there an issue about expectations, perhaps built up by the media or built up by politicians? There's also, to some extent, I'm sure, the fact that it's much easier to complain than it used to be. We don't have to sit down and write a letter, put a stamp on the envelope and put it in the post. Nowadays, most complaints are received electronically by an email or even by telephone on an answer phone. And there's also whole departments built up in the NHS to enable people to voice their concerns or complaints. Of course, you'll be familiar with the patient advice and liaison service, otherwise known as PALS. And this tends to be the normal route that pain, complaints in the NHS come through. So why do we upset patients? Well, usually, I'm sure, it's not deliberate. The vast majority tend to be about miscommunication, and whether that's a lack of understanding of us as doctors, or a lack of understanding by the patients of what we're trying to communicate. Maybe a complete absence of communication. Maybe patients or their relatives would like more. Some of it, of course, is to do with language barriers, either from the doctors themselves or from the patients who may not have English as their first language. And English can be quite a subtle language sometimes. And the information that we're trying to convey is, is sometimes misunderstood by patients and by ourselves. There are cultural differences undoubtedly on both sides. And in stressful situations, not only for the doctors, but the patients and their relatives who are unwell, stress can make people much more sensitive about even the slightest things. And they may perceive things quite wrongly and they don't necessarily perceive the intent correctly. 
many of the things that people complain about are completely unrelated to the clinical care and maybe to do with things going on in personal lives. Also, doctors can unwittingly pro project their own mood over to the patient, which isn't anything personal, but we are human beings. And sometimes our domestic lives or our personality can sometimes cause problems in communication and uh, it can upset patients or their relatives. I want to talk about some of the human factors that lead to these complaints. First of all, all of us are human and we all make mistakes. There are many different expectations and managing expectations between us, not just between us as colleagues, but between patients and relatives is part of the art and part of experience that will build up in your career as a doctor. Sometimes there's breakdown in team relationships and causing teamwork problems. Sometimes junior doctors with the best will in the world will give patients the wrong information or slightly incorrect information, maybe even things that they just have not appreciated about the clinical problem. Sometimes that can get consultants and senior doctors in trouble through no fault of their own. Sometimes the systems themselves are set up to cause failures and cause problems. And it is often systems that need to be addressed, not just the individual concerns of a patient or their relative. We've talked a bit about misinterpretation just now. And also as healthcare workers, we can get very fatigued and overworked. Most of us know a lot about that in the recent Corona pandemic. This can clearly affect what happens in our interactions between ourselves and patients and their relatives and may in turn lead to complaints. So as I've said, communication seems to be one of the major causes of complaints that come through to the NHS. Clinical treatment surprisingly is relatively minor only about a tenth of all complaints, certainly in general surgery, are about the actual treatment that the patients received. That's quite surprising as us as doctors because our whole focus in general is about the clinical treatment rather than these other matters. Other complaints naturally might include problems that have happened that may have been avoidable incidents relating to patient safety or medical errors. Inevitably, these will cause complaints. In surgery, we have a massive waiting list as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm sure a number of the complaints that will come through over the next few months will relate to delays. Delays of being seen in outpatients, delays of receiving the surgery which they obviously need. There are also a number of complaints about attitudes. I've mentioned about misperception or misinterpretation. And that can lead on to complaints coming because people have perceived perhaps an arrogance or a, uh, an attitude that they felt offensive. Most of the time, this is not remotely deliberate. But we do have to be careful about the attitude we're projecting when we interact with our patients and their relatives. Well, fortunately, in general surgery, we're quite low down the list in terms of the number of complaints that we receive. That might be surprising. A&E is definitely golden cup in terms of being first place for complaints. And that could be for a whole number of reasons. A&E waiting times are a great cause of complaints. And the number of patients that they see through the department is inevitably going to lead to an increase in the complaints. Obstetrics and gynecology and psychiatry come a close second. And about 10% of all complaints coming in are for trauma and orthopedics. Like I say, general surgery 
so far is only about 6% of all complaints. As Amira said at the beginning, black and ethnic minority doctors receive twice as many complaints as non-BAME doctors. Now the reasons for this have been analyzed a great deal and it's very complex, but it may be something to do with communication matters. It may be to do with racial prejudice in the general population. So what do people want? Why are people complaining? What are they expecting? Well, generally speaking, when people complain, people want, first of all, an explanation. What happened? What went wrong? How can I understand what it was that I'm not happy about? They may also want an apology. Most people would also like things to improve so that the same thing that happened to them does not, not happen to others. The vast majority of people are not complaining because they want money. But of course, there is a small minority who have pound signs in their eyes and are trying perhaps to try and get a little bit of money out of the trust or even a lot of money out of the trust. So back to communication problems. There may be poor communication with the patients, the relatives, carers, and even communication between colleagues and other staff that cause issues in patient care. People might receive conflicting information. Perhaps a very junior doctor has said something that they haven't really understood about the patient's care. And then further information is given by the consultant that conflicts. That can be very confusing and frustrating. Maybe there's inadequate information. The patient would like some more. Inadequate documentation is certainly something that I'll come back to a bit later on. Breaking bad news is always a very sensitive thing to do, and it can be done very well, or it can be done very badly. And I'm sure you can all think of examples of both that you've experienced in your own practice. Here's a couple of real quotes. People coming from outside the UK may have cultural issues that cause people to complain. In my country, the doctor is a kind of king who can do everything that he wants to. So there were no actual dilemmas. Whatever I decided was the right thing. Well, that's certainly not the case in the UK. The whole approach of explaining every aspect of treatment and giving the patient the option to actually make her own decisions, it was something totally new to me. Well, I can have a whole new talk about this sort of thing, but this is often the business that we face as surgeons when we're trying to consent somebody for treatment. There's all sorts of legal aspects to this, but essentially most people in the UK and certainly it's a legal requirement now, is to explain the treatment in great detail, but also in layman's language, so that the patient can actually make the decision, not the doctor. This has certainly changed over the last 20 to 30 years in the UK, and is still something that is not general practice in other countries. I've come to know that the most important thing in the UK, which I didn't really take seriously, is confidentiality. In our culture, confidentiality is important, but in the UK, it is very, very important. Well, that's certainly true. Now, I mentioned earlier that it's often the perception of other people that can cause problems and can lead to complaints. With the best will in the world, doctors new to the NHS can still face massive problems. And I don't deny that accepting diversity in the NHS, although we are trying terribly hard to eliminate it, is still a problem. And in some places worse than others. Doctors from overseas are often viewed with great suspicion until they have proved themselves. There may even be negative comments Seniors can also be judgmental, unsympathetic, unsupportive. 
This can be compared with attitudes to locally trained medical students and junior doctors who often have a much easier time, even though they've been brought up into the system of the NHS. So there are certainly problems to, to sort out, but I hope that we listen and I hope that we can sort these. And certainly these attitudes need to be challenged if we're going to generate a much more egalitarian and diverse NHS. You may feel that clinical practice these days is a minefield and you're not the only ones. There's often a tension between reflecting on what we are doing. How did I do? What could I have done better? What did I do well? Also, we also encouraged to have a duty of candor. In other words, to disclose as much as possible, to be as honest and truthful and open as possible. But does that lead us in danger of being prosecuted? Many doctors have been prosecuted and in, faced criminal charges in the UK. Also, does it lead us open to having more complaints? Will we attract disciplinary proceedings? Well, the idea is really for that not to happen. And in many places, we're trying to introduce much more of a learn and not blame culture. But there is still that fear about being open. Anyway, here's about responding to complaints. There are key performance indicators or KPIs in the NHS that we have to respond to all complaints within three working days. That's just first of all to acknowledge that the complaint has been received and you don't need to get involved in that. The PALS department will respond to the complainant uh, uh, within three working days saying, yes, we've received your complaint. However, a more detailed response by the people who are being complained about needs to reach the complainant within 30 working days. That may seem quite a short period of time, but generally speaking, it's possible. If patients or their relatives are not happy with the complaint response, they can then respond to the trust and ask for some more detail or ask more specific questions. It may be addressed in writing, or you may want to have a face-to-face -face meeting in order to sort it all out. There's nothing to be ashamed of with this, and you certainly need some support. The complaint will either be resolved or referred to the NHS Ombudsman, or in rare cases, referred to the legal department. Interestingly, three quarters of all complaints are upheld to a greater or lesser extent by the trust. So that means that there is some truth, at least, in what they're complaining about. And that's a very healthy thing. The complaints are looked at in great detail. And we do hope that through the clinical governance process, that we can respond to complaints and improve the level of service that we provide. So what not to do? Oh, I didn't realize that was an animation, but there we go. <laughs> First of all, don't be defensive or angry. There's no need, even though we might feel that it's an unfair complaint. It's not a personal thing. Don't be defensive or angry. If you feel like that, just give it a little bit of time and come back and address it. Don't cover up what's been done and certainly don't run away. It's not appropriate to blame the patient, the relative or one's colleague. Face up to what's happened and address it. Don't automatically blame yourself. Like I say, it's not necessarily a personal thing. It may be something that just needs to be addressed as a communication issue. Importantly, don't write or say anything until you've looked through all the clinical notes. And that's why documentation is so important. Complaints can sometimes come 
many months after the incident has taken place. So it's really important that we all document adequately in the patient clinical notes. What to do then? Stop, reflect, think about your emotions, don't write or say anything in anger, look through all the documentation, always be open, always be honest, talk to seniors for advice, talk to people that you trust. And this is surprisingly uh, not universal. I'm always amazed when people are not a member of a defense organization. Those organizations are there to help you and the subscription is definitely worth it. So please, I do recommend that you all belong to a defense organization. And I wouldn't recommend one over another, but have a look into it, do some research, talk to your colleagues and definitely pay the subscription. It's really worth it. So some examples then. This is the first one, a very trivial example, but one that I think illustrates some of the ways that we can respond to these things. A teenager comes in for surgery for bilateral ingrowing toenails. She's allergic to nuts. So phenol, which is derived from almond oil, can't be applied to the nail beds. The patient's warned, first of all in clinic, before surgery that actually it's not a good idea to have both toenails done at the same time because it could be very painful. Secondly, the patient was warned that the toenail has a high rate of regrowth, particularly if phenol isn't used. But the complaint comes through, the mother has complained that their daughter had lots of pain and the toenails have grown back again. Before making the complaint, the mother had paid for a private consultation in a foot clinic where somebody had criticized the original operation. She was also trying to claim for the money that she'd spent on that private consultation. So how do we respond? Well, first of all, take your time, think about it, let your frustration calm down, acknowledge the patient's concerns, but stick to the facts. There was documentation that the patient had preoperatively been advised not to have both toes done at once due to the chance of pain, but they'd insisted on going ahead. They'd also been advised on the risk of recurrence and the risks of surgery were clearly documented in the clinic letter and the consent form and the discharge summary. And like I say, the patient or their mother had not attempted to contact the operating surgeon prior to paying for a private consultation. So these facts were made clear in the letter of response and nothing was heard since. Another complaint, quite common. An elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy was performed the patient was then admitted as an emergency and found to have a bile leak requiring laparoscopic washout and the placement of a drain. It wasn't due to a major duct injury, but a leak from one of these ducts of Lushka vessels in the liver bed. Obviously, this required several visits to hospital, outpatient and a couple of inpatient stays to deal with the drains and also an ERCP to stent the area until it was completely resolved. Understandably, the patient had received quite significant disruption to their life and asked if it was all avoidable. So here's the response. First of all, acknowledge the concerns of the patient. Every point raised in the letter was addressed seriously. Fortunately, bar leaks are rare but it is a recognized complication of cholecystectomy, and that was mentioned in the preoperative clinic letter, as well as clearly marked on the consent form, which had been signed by the surgeon and by the patient. This demonstrates that all this had been discussed and understood. Also, the surgeon was able to say that their personal bile leak rate, which was 
not above the national average. In fact, it was quite significantly below. So although it's clear that the patient was very unlucky and had significant disruption to their life, then this could be pointed out and the patient was happy with the response. This third complaint regards an elderly patient admitted with abdominal pain found to have severe constipation. A manual evacuation was required to be performed under general anaesthetic. The patient had a number of cardiac comorbidities and unfortunately, while the patient was in the hospital, he developed a number of complications and passed away. The relatives complained about his treatment, particularly in this case, the attitude of the nursing staff and the lack of communication that they'd had from the clinical staff. The notes were carefully examined, statements taken from everyone that had been looking after the patient. Every point again that they were, they'd raised was addressed. The ward staff, particularly the nursing staff and the seniors involved, responded to their concerns about nursing care. Interestingly, the documentation in the notes was very poor and there were big gaps both in the nursing notes and in the clinical notes from the doctors. Apologies were made for these deficiencies in care, but the death, the ultimate event was considered unavoidable. It was a time bomb related to the patient's cardiac comorbidities. So those are a few examples, and I hope that that's useful, useful pointers to help to respond to some sort of complaints like that. So how do we improve our communication? First of all, learn effective communication. Always return telephone calls as swiftly as we can. That can often offset frustration and the buildup of anxiety, particularly among relatives these days who are unable to visit their, patient, their, their relatives in hospital. It's worth checking their understanding if you've got any doubt that they're not really understanding what you're trying to say. Avoid giving conflicting information. And if possible, make sure that there's a single member of the team that is responsible for communicating with a relative and usually it's better to have just one relative who is the point of contact. Provide as much information as the relative or the patient is happy to be to receive. Obviously check with the patient themselves about how much information they would like their relative to know. Thorough documentation is absolutely essential. And there is a GMC 10 point standard that you ought to have a look at and be familiar with. Electronic note taking does a lot of this for us, but that is unfortunately still quite rare in the NHS. Receive training, not just in general communication skills, but in particularly breaking bad news, as it's a real skill that requires experience and sensitivity. Can we avoid complaints? Probably not. In fact, definitely not completely. But be aware of the following. The NHS is all about so-called patient-centered care. So in this country, the patient is definitely the king or the queen, not the doctor or the medical staff or the nurses, even if we might like to think so. Do read GMC's Good Medical Practice Guidance. Very practical and useful tips and guidance. Do attend courses, as many as you can. That's another benefit of joining a medical defense organization. They often offer online or face-to-face -face courses for communication skills, how to handle complaints, etc. They provide learning, but also if you did have a complaint, it demonstrates that you've taken positive steps to improve. Find NHS mentors, either a formal supervisor, educational or clinical supervisor, or somebody that you admire or respect. Watch and learn from others, and that can be both good and bad examples. 
So if you do get a complaint and it turns serious, what protection do you have? Well, fortunately, we do have something called the Local Authority Social Care National Health Service Complaints Regulations. And the whole idea is to try to achieve local resolution, resolution before it goes anywhere else. And that's the idea and the principles that PALS departments stand on. Similarly, in the NHS, unlike the private sector, it's the NHS trust that is liable for the conduct of their employees, not you personally. You can't be personally sued if you're an NHS contracted employee. Clinical negligence is handled by the NHS litigation authority. So that's where the lawyers get involved. But again, it's the trust lawyers and the National Litigation Authority that should handle anything like that. Of course, medical defence organisations, as well as unions, such as the British Medical Association, are very useful sources of advice and help. The Doctors Association UK is a relatively new organisation, but is there to support doctors and particularly provide a source of advice and help. One of their campaigns is the Learn Not Blame campaign. And this is being distributed throughout NHS trusts to try and improve the culture of justice within the NHS rather than people blaming one another for errors and faults. The idea behind this is to make the NHS a considerably safer organisation in comparison to the airline industry, which has adopted a learn not blame culture for many years. Well, I do hope you found that helpful. This is a very trivial cartoon just to finish off. Do give feedback to the ESSGB and we hope that you will find this extremely useful for your future career. Thank you. So again, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Dunkley, for this presentation. I really enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed it as well and found it useful, everyone. Please send us your comments and questions on our email or Twitter account and we might do another video to answer them. Uh, thank you, everyone.